Welcome back, everybody. And so this guy doesn't need any introduction. Uh, this is the one, the only Wilson Mart. So, you know, I've known Wilson for a very long time. He's um, arguably one of the most influential area, uh, performance engineers and now um, also going to be talking to you about net and uh, security. So, Wilson, do you want to come off camera and uh, I'm going to give you control, uh, command and control. Okay, now how do I share my screen here? I think you need to make me a presenter, right? Yep, you are going to be the the the, the one in charge. So then see my, you should see now have my a presenter, screen. right? So you should be able to share your screen. Okay, super. I'll share my main screen. Well, I'm going to leave you to it. Can you see it um, now? I can see it now. You're looking great, Wilson. Actually, okay. you look 10 years younger than last time we talked. So I don't know what you're doing. Lockdown's been good to you. It's not been good to the rest of us. So I will yeah, come back right. with lots of questions once you finish. So uh, the, the legend, which is Wilson Mark. Okay, you stop it. <laughs> you're mocking me now. <laughs> well, anyways, I'm here to talk about security testing because it's such an top important topic, right? You guys heard about ransomware. You heard about this gasoline shooting up to $3 on, because of the Colonial Pipeline attack, right? And the SolarWinds attack resulted in the leak of almost every document in the NSA, the CIA, FBI, all DOD, all Justice Department, and many corporations. So, you know, I'd like to share with you a, a visualization here in, in this presentation. Uh, and a, a timeline, you know, a tool that you can use. Also, I was thinking about giving you an idea about what we can say when explaining our budget for security testing, and also the fact that security is a mindset. So I'll look into some cultural changes that are necessary. And also, if you stay put in the, till the end, I'll have some answers for you on how to have a secure and happy life. Okay, so here we go. The uh, here is a uh, a CVE that I, that before SolarWinds, the largest breach in history occurred on March 13, 2017, when Equifax lost private credit files. I'm talking about you know every uh, application that people have made uh, to the uh, to get credit for credit cards it was lost. You know 148 million in the United States, and this vulnerability occurred and opened the door and it's cataloged with an ID in the US National Vulnerable uh, Vulnerability Database, uh, is a CVE number. And every um, vulnerability that's found, uh, it gets reported uh, to this US government as it's probably one of the best uses of my tax money here. And if you can see here, what happened was this incorrect exception handling. That's probably one of the top issues that we run into, incorrect exception handling, and that results in a ability for the attacker to execute arbitrary commands. And that's one word, arbitrary commands, means that they can do whatever they want, okay? So here's the timeline. And here again, this is not to scale, uh, but it's a, you know, the idea is to see what the chronically of events. So it was exploited and then it was reported uh, at a different time, and there's some discussion about what about the reporting and whether it was uh, fast enough. Uh, but regardless, you know, just today, as a matter of fact, the U.S. president signed an order to require federal agencies to report intrusions in a timely manner. And what's tragic about this story is that the vendor, and actually was provided a patch, you know, they provide, the vendor provided a patch to fix this vulnerability uh, on, um, the March 7th, this is six days. It took six days for people to break in and collect all the information uh, for Equifax. You know, by the way, we don't know uh, how much, uh, how long uh, this exploitation occurred in the wild, uh, but we security researchers have come up with a, a, what we call a, a enumeration of weaknesses that are uh, in the, uh, you know, lurking in your software and, and maybe mine that we wrote. 
And so the idea here is that we want to be able to do some threat hunting and some uh, idea of uh, what these zero day vulnerabilities are discovered. And it's important, this time idea here, this time demarcation is that uh, we want to know what the time to patch is. And I'm an advocate and I hope that you will help me advocate to your congressman, to you know whoever will listen, is to keep track of the time to patch within vendors. And I think that's coming in. the legislation. And already what's happening is that 90 days after this ability was discovered and reported to the CV, the National Vulnerability Database privately, they keep it private until 90 days when they make an announcement whether or not there's a patch going on and then it goes out. The reason is they can only wait so long because we know that you know if they keep it private, it's going to do more damage than if they had announced it so that way people can, can act, right? And there are many patches, I mean, and, and many um, vulnerabilities that are out there, which there are no patches uh, because the vendor did not, um, you know, get their act together uh, in time. And so the, this black line here, you wanted to have that happen before the vulnerabilities exploited. And so our central task, you know, within as, as testers is to help scan, analyze, fix, and test in these cycles. And there is a measurement of how fast we do this. It's called the TTR in the industry, time to remediate. Um, the, how we do this is that uh, vendors would take the NVD, take the information that they have in an automated area, put it into their scanner software, and then we'll run this every day. Every time that uh, we run it, it may find a new item, which is why it's so critical for us not to just run it once, you know, and then release the software. This has to be run, the scanner for vulnerabilities has to be run every day. So that way you can see, hey, did anything new pop up? Just like, you know, we do doom scrolling on our phones. Uh, so there's training that's, you know, involved that we could say, okay, we want to be able to understand how to analyze these threats and what happens when a CVE appears that, uh, you know, related to one of our software that we're using, okay? Okay, next. How long do you think is the average uh, of this TTR, right? So to compare, let's use a metric, something like, oh, uh, I don't know, pregnancy, <laughs> okay? So in other words, the the analysis that Sonatype did, one of the vendors, yeah, is that it took us, you know, at on average, more than the time it takes for us to get pregnant, have a baby, and maybe even take some time off, and we can still meet the average. This is very disturbing because, you know, what happens when along this time? You know that you heard report that six days was how much it took, and here we are nine months later, and that's still before the average of where we are. So it's really kind of a disturbing situation. So what do we do? You know, what's going on? What can we do? Uh, to shake the tree, you know, to how do we get the pipelines and the disciplines and the metrics? And one of the things that I think we can do is uh, start, you know, measuring to, as a beginning point. Now for that, we can use the uh, DORA or the DevOps Research and Assessment. They've done a great job that says, okay, these are the four or five things that we can measure to find out how quickly we can do it. What the top people in the industry are able to do and what metrics do they use? How do they measure? Well, availability is not like one of the four, but it is important because this uptime tells you how many, uh, you know, how much time users are, are productive. So we want to use a user-based kind of a measurement. But for us to say, well, you know, availability is great right now. We're at, you know, 99% on there but it still doesn't address the security issue because you know that could be lurking inside the system right as we see so what do we have to do so we need to know the lead time for changes time between the code commit to running in production that will tell us not the cycle time by the way which is the um the internal time this lead time for changes us external in production between the time that we did a code commit 
The other one is the deployment frequency or the pace of effort that we have. And if we're moving too fast, what you're gonna see is a change failure rate or abbreviated, uh, sometimes it's CFR. That's the percentage of changes in production resulting in a degraded service. And the question is, how stable are we? This is a stability number, right? And then there's, you know, the industry has a thing called a mean time to restore uh, that takes us for incidents to, for service to be restored. And this is very important for the security security aspect and the reason is is because the better we are at restoring we can take risks at working with this so one of the biggest concerns that we have is that people are not uh, feeling safe enough for them to take risks so that way they can address issues and there's really a good you know a, a statistic that we really need to see uh, about the psychological safety in order to make this stuff happen okay and i'll show you this a report that we did um, that you can see. The re recovery time objective is also important as well, uh, as much as uh, how much data that you lose, you know, if you go down, right? So the first step is really to take a look at these statistics and start measuring them to see your improvement over time, okay? Now the question here uh, is that what is slowing us down, okay? And so here's kind of the you know, one example uh, of this from a program's manifest, uh, specifying what packages or dependencies should be downloaded for use with a particular program. Uh, the most loved and highest paid security testers become a consultant to developers on these and other libraries. So the idea of a security tester is really more in today's world, the ideal situation is for security people, the testers, to be able to say, okay, you know, here, this is an express package, and here's the problem that we have uh, with it. And that maybe there's an alternative. Sometimes you might need that. Maybe we can go to Walmart and use their uh, program instead of ex uh, express. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, utilities, like, for example, the serverless or Chai for testing. So top security people, sec testers, would understand each one of these and then keep an eye on the vulnerabilities of each and then also advise development teams what to do if that shows up, okay? Again, we only have a few days, so we, we wanna look ahead and see what able, you know, what, what, what's going on. So what happens when we initialize the modules? You know, each of these specified uh, can reference many additional dependencies, and each of those dependencies can reference some additional dependencies. So you walk down this entire chain of dependencies and you end up with something like this, right? This gives you an idea of the difficulty of finding and fixing dependencies, what I call the jello effect. If you touch one thing, it may break a number of other components. And this is why a repeatable end-to-end -end test suite is so important in the functional level, as well as performance, as well as uh, the uh, the entire uh, security posture. You know, our difficulty is also compounded by the growth and substitutes among components over time. So if you, this is a, a graph of growth and the number of components created for each language. If you can see here, more than anybody else, NPM or the Node uh, Package Manager, it's really taken off, more than Java, more than Python. This means that automation of testing is needed to handle this geometric increase over time, right? Now, I won't spend much time in this, as like a lot of you already know about this whole story about this uh, well, processes of DevOps, of automation. But the thing I wanted to emphasize is the things that we want to do. Like one is, if we have environment variables, instead of hard coding, it's, that's the most vexing issue because a lot of developers, they use tutorials from, um, from you know, off of a, um, you know, the class in the university and that's got hard coded stuff everywhere, right? And so we, one of the things we have to do on a professional level is really to take those secrets out and put them in a, an environment variable or in a vault. Uh, so that way uh, it's safe, right? And then 
Uh, we also want to do some scanning that, of this and also penetration testing to make sure that when we work with it, uh, we will be able to you know, see whether it works or not, whether uh, we're protected. And also the thing to remember about this, these scans is that different languages need different emphasis. There's a significant difference in the source of vulnerabilities depending on the programming language. For JavaScript and NPM, there are many more vulnerabilities caught indirectly by referencing vulnerable components downloaded. So it's important that we run what is called software component analysis, abbreviated SCA. Um, about vulnerability. This is an industry term, not just you know to a particular vendor. However, a, a Python. Okay, thanks. Um, so it's important that we run uh, for Python uh, a, a SAST, what S A S T. Um, so that way, you know, we can catch uh, coding errors inside the uh, individual programs. Okay, and there are other acronyms and tools. So let's talk about those. The, there are two major areas, and I think that a lot of testers spend a lot of time on dev, but I don't see a lot of testers really testing the tools that are being used in production. And so let me talk about briefly so you know what I'm talking about. Now, we already talked about SCA. We already talked about uh, to, you know, for the security of, the, of uh, containers. Uh, the other one is um, dynamic application security testers uh, testing on here. And what that is, is basically using automated scripts in order to see what happens when you dynamically run a program. There's also this thing now, very recent, called interactive application security testing, where they would have an agent sitting inside the program and uh, watching as interactively people put in uh, the individual transactions to see what happens. There is in the industry right now a what we call a zero trust environment where each application defends itself by referencing a uh, IAM or a identity and access management and, and secret vaults that, you know, that I talked about. And many organizations have a, what they call a SOC or security operations center, which monitors in real time the analysis of logs and metrics gathered from all operations. So one of the things we need to do in security testing is to make sure that logs and metrics get sent over to this central uh, security information and event analysis program or, or really, and sometimes you would have more data coming into that than the entire application uses, right? It's not uncommon. In fact, it's quite common for it to be two, three, four times longer. And the longer the system goes, the more data gets um, accumulated over time. Um, the other one is this web application firewall that uh, looks at traffic, blocks known malicious IP addresses, and uh, things like you know DNS addresses. So if the DNS was created a day ago, it would block it because you know most valid DNAs, D DNS servers, uh, weren't created a day ago. It was created months or years before. Uh, the other one is the you should, name you should know is the next generation firewall, which adds awareness of application and integration and intrusion prevention and data leak prevention features. Now, an example of what a SOC looks into when a security mechanism is, is such as scanning is, is turned off. So uh, this is really an issue here because uh, there are a lot of mechanisms in place. And just like you know, some programs don't send out logs, don't log transactions or log when a security provision is turned off, uh, that needs to happen in order for the, uh, the SOC to be able to understand the security posture at any given time. Here's an example of what else we can do. Now, my question is, what is wrong with this picture? Right. So the idea here is that you've got a, I'm sorry, a, uh, a information over time, and that helps to, you know, to see for managers to say, hey, you know, we only have like, you know, 20% of our security vulnerabilities have been mitigated, and it's only taking, you know, taking us, uh, you know, like. 20 days, you know, or, or you know, pregnancy at <laughs> time. So it's helpful to have this, you know, public shaming going on. 
Um, but the the key thing also too, I think, is also being able to understand the uh, impact and the uh, you know what kind of trouble that we potentially get into and be proactive about the situation rather than just reactive. And let me give you an example of that. This here from Snack, one, one of the um, you know major vendors uh, out there for security. Uh, this scatter plot requires us to kind of think in multiple dimensions. So if you can you know, give me a, a minute to explain. Uh, this analysis is where each type of vulnerability in the vertical Uh, versus the number of different manifestations of, of the uh, vulnerabilities. In other words, any types of malicious packages and cross, you know, like cross-site scripting on the top here, it's no. But they infect few individual projects, you know, that are out there. So instead, we maybe want to focus more on vulnerabilities with the largest blast radius or impact of the number of projects that's out there. And one example of that is what's called a prototype protect, uh, pollution such as Lodash would have, which use the same code injection techniques for evil, while JavaScript frameworks lo like Lodash, jQuery, and others use it to customize code. Because one of the things that uh, Lodash and jQuery does is that you would have one component that's in there that would be added to the system that would be impacting all of the components. And that's a very dangerous but yet powerful thing. Right? So I'm concerned especially that WebAssembly is a uh, you know, product that uses a similar feature. Uh, very powerful again, but also very dangerous in the wrong hands. So my suggestion here is if your application is using WebAssembly, is to take a very go close look, allocate enough time to be chasing after vulnerabilities, because I can guarantee you there will be many that's coming. Now, here's the last uh, item here. This is over the uh, idea of a lifetime of a project, uh, and from design to you know initial minimal MVP to iterations and wide use. Uh, the more people, the more it costs to change things, and the more expensive issues become. So if we have a productivity loss, you know when you goes down for a day or or so, uh, you know that's bad, but you know, if you have a recoverable outage, okay, you know, we got over it. It's just, you know, it's, uh, it's still within one day, it still meets our 99.9% .9 availability, right? But if you, as you go through a unrecoverable outage, like you lose a day of data, that's a bad thing. It's embarrassing, right? And it's costs us money and, you know, customers that are unhappy. Uh, but when you get a breach, when you get ransomware notices, and when you're actually losing data, you know, like the CIA and, and the NSA losing data that they're supposed to be keeping for the rest of the nation, it's, that's a where it's a very bad thing. All right. So what do we do about this? All right. So uh, I think it's it's culture. It's a culture for you to just sometimes the to avoid some of these issues, these vulnerabilities, it's a matter of a few keystrokes. It's a matter of maybe editing a file and adding stuff in there. It's a matter of maybe just another commit and it will be working and it will be safer. It's another of just rebuilding or retesting. But I think the reason why that a lot of people don't do it is they just don't give a, <laughs> right? And so what I think we need as a, culture as a company is for people who will, are willing to go out of their own way to help other people. And I think that's the one thing that I would look for in an interview for developers and for security testers as a whole, uh, is that if you have people who go out of their way, then they are going to do those keystrokes and the files and rebuild and retest in order to keep everybody else safe, right? And the other one is like I talked about psychological safety uh, is a blameless culture where uh, only 20%, by the way, of CEOs say, or CIOs is say, yeah, we have a blameless culture or working towards it. It's a very small minority, but yet it's, it's very much needed. And I think this is going to be the key. Uh, I'm going to write more about this, uh, this blameless. Um, there is a survey that we've done. Uh, in, in McKinsey that 
uh, talks about this very thing. They did an analysis very much like the door analysis. They looked at the effectiveness and how quickly people move within Microsoft and several other companies. And uh, they came up with the idea that uh, a psychological safety, the blameless culture is what allows the fastest moving people, the fastest innovators uh, to thrive. And they've done, and they've looked at a correlation between there. So take a look at that. This is in that mck.co uh, short link. Uh, now, uh, I've got a few more minutes, and so I won't go into this thing, but I think that uh, I can cover, again, that. I use this to see, you know, depending on how much time I have left, so I'm going to rush through this. Uh, the handling, like we saw before with that CVE, Error handling was the number one issue that people have. We want it as a company to be able to uh, standardize on how to do the error handling. So that way uh, it's just not left up to chance, right? And also people are doing it. Uh, and then, but the more that you, you kind of look at it in terms of code reviews, uh, the better off the company will be just reviewing it. Just having code reviews is, is half the battle, right? And uh, again, we talk about uh, you know chaos engineering in production, where like Netflix was the one who kind of put this together. Say, okay, you know, if you just delete a resource in production, what happens? And people are like going, like, you would delete something on purpose? Yes, yes. And the reason is, is we want to be able to test what happens when that occurs. So if we can delete it for one, then that means that anytime something happens, we will know that if anything happens, it will be taken care of, right? Again, that safety net that we want to build, and not just psychologically in reality. And then there's, you know, testing and disaster recovery. And a lot of companies just never bother to do this because, ah, oh, it's too much effort and so forth. Because if you don't do a test of the disaster recovery, you will never know. You might as well go and buy yourself a ransomware uh, account in first and, and if you uh, don't have that disaster recovery because you'll never know. And so, uh, you know, we talked about patches and the component vulnerability. As, so you can take a look at the rest of these here uh, when we, uh, we can talk about it online if you're interested in any particular situation. But there's a number of different ways that you can actually do some work. One suggestion I have is that for if your GitHub account, uh, it now, a uh, GitHub now offers a way for a YubiKey to, uh, to hold your private keys. So basically it's a, a separate a, a card that are a plug in to your USB that you will store your keys uh, in that and you can carry it with you rather than leaving on your laptop and getting it stolen. So, um, that's really the major major thing that I have is so the takeaways here is hurry <laughs> you know you have a ticking time bomb uh, in the, that you don't really know about you know automate and don't turn off those security features understand that different languages need different tools right and shift left early in the development workflow and make issues and progress visible in dashboards over time and prioritize by blast radius and you know get out of your way to help others, you know, and build a blameless culture. And that's really what it takes for security. So anyways, so that's my little spiel and my soapbox. Well, Wilson, as always, it's an absolute pleasure and I will be getting one of those keys. Um, I, I, I'm working for NTT at the moment and I, I saw the most unusual scenario of a security breach, which was one of the developers had uh, been on a Teams call, shared his screen, and it had his private and public click key for the production systems in the Teams video stream. Yeah. So yeah. You know, how do you even detect that? It's, you know, it's hard work, but you know, part of it is I think it's opened all of our eyes. I've literally got people messaging me going, you know, is the NSA trying to cut off Wilson? You know, should he be telling us all these kind of secrets? You know, and it's been an absolutely fantastic talk as always, Wilson. So I don't know if you've got time to join us for the discussion panel, uh, but it'd be great to have you back uh, if you're if you're free in an hour. But um, yeah, um, as always, it's an absolute honor. Yeah, well, thank you. That's, that's my honor. So uh, now, uh, did you want to cover some time? Uh, you have any time for any questions left? Yeah, what well, we can do. Let's do five minutes and just throw in some questions. Let me let me um, share my screen for a second. It'll only I'll just take back presenter. Um, excellent. So, 
we've got the first question, which has come uh, from Kumar, who's asking um, what the common issues with client devices that are not active in the AD or global AD if they're using uh, Azure on, on the network. How can you ensure security updates happening are done on all devices? Oh, that's a good one. You know, you had mentioned the uh, the, the Azure, and one of the nice things about the Azure system is they have this, what they call a just-in-time uh, feature uh, that it will, uh, for example, that's the port 3389 for, uh, you know, for getting into the Windows server, that is open on only when you ask for it, and otherwise it's closed. Uh, and also, they would do the same thing with it, keep it open all the time. Um, so that's one you know, big uh, way to go. The other one is they have this uh, thing called a managed account where the, uh, the, it, you don't use uh, keys uh, for it. You would use, it would keep track of the, its own um, account. It would generate the keys when it needs to and throw them away when it needs to. So take a look at that. They call this managed accounts, uh, managed identities uh, that you can use. Um, so it's you know very um, you know advanced uh, kind of a way, and I think that's going to be the standard for everybody you know in the future. Yeah, I've got I've got a tip for for ADs as well. I've I've got here a, a, a Pi Zero running uh, a Poison Ivy, which if you've ever seen, it's for taking uh, getting root passwords. So you literally plug it into the network and it's network device, and it then goes and gets the root password. So I guess you could use something like Kali or play around with some of the you know burp suite tools or things like that. Have you got any kind of tips for people around tools and things that they can use to get them started? Uh, to get started in what, I'm sorry? Well, you know, just like anything like OWASP or anything or Hack the Box, you know, is there any kind of, you know, sites where you'd recommend budding security testers go uh, and, and learn some more? Yeah, one suggestion I have uh, is to get certified in the CISSP. Uh, now, that is a security professional thing, right? But I think that uh, it is very thorough. Uh, and uh, I've studied for it for 10 years, right? Because uh, that is just the core information anybody didn't know. Uh, if you are working for a federal government, uh, they would require you to pass the Security Plus exam before hiring you. So uh, this security capability and this understanding of security is a prerequisite now for many jobs. Uh, you probably see that, right? Security Plus uh, required or CISSP, not just in security jobs, but also in just regular day-to-day -day jobs, even testers on there. So I would say that look at that and, and there's, you know, I mean, tools come and go uh, and there are, uh, you know, a number of them that's out there. And I'll send you this, um, you know, a link to the various, um, you know, tools page that I have for you. Okay, um, I'll definitely do that. I know we've got another one which is on the same lines, which I think is kind of saying, the static code analysis SAP kind of landscape, you know, what what's the minimum kind of tests? Do you recommend anything like OWASP as just as a standard or for just kind of the basics? Or would you suggest to people that they need to, uh, you know, go on to some kind of course or at least learn the fundamentals? Well, there are uh, um, program. There's a program out there for really every pro every language. Uh, for example, with Python. Uh, you would have is there's an open source one where it would uh, keep track of the um, vulnerabilities that's been reported, all the CVEs, and whether your program has it. And it would run it on your laptop and it'll tell you. However, uh, it only is the ones that are reported. The, what we really need, you know, on a professional level to be safe is to use a, a proprietary analysis from some of these vendors like and they all you know have them and artifactory um, x-ray is the one that uh, we've been using uh, but the but there's many others you know as well uh, that will uh, that have people that would go out and look at these analyze and go threat hunting and then they would put their own CVEs basically uh, you know in that system and that's really what we need as a uh, you know if you were as a company that wants to you're going to have to spend some money to to get a proactive uh, response rather than a reactive situation right um, so anyway so that's really the main thing the and then also the question is any standards to formalize tests um, 
I don't really know uh, of any, I think, but I think one suggestion I have is to take a look at the way that the security industry categorizes whether something is uh, critical or high or medium or, or low. Uh, I think just looking at those uh, would be helpful because uh, you need to do the same thing for prioritizing. Like for example, this vulnerability that we talked about with the Equifax, uh, that was rated as critical because it could do anything <laughs> at once and it could be triggered every single time, right? And um, so that would be the, the option. I think the one, the best thing to do is to look at the rating system uh, that they use to figure it out and see what the criteria is on there. Okay. Anything that else? Sounds great. And I think you were going to share some links with us and we'll make sure we pass those on to the attendees today. But, you okay. know, You've obviously got a great website, but you know, which I love because it goes get it's hosted in GitHub, and I only just realized how you can do that. But you know, what's the best way to kind of find out more, you know, and visit you? Yeah, just wilsonmar.github.io, and um, I uh, tweet. I, I put too much stuff in there, so yeah, you, you learn more than you'd ever want to know on anything <laughs> tech. Oh, so I, yeah, I take a look it. at that and uh, let me know. Yeah, let me know. You know if there's anything missing or, or um, you know that needs to be fixed. Well, it's been it's been an honor as always, Wilson. Uh, and well, honor's mine. thanks so much for doing opening a lot of people's eyes today. All right, thanks. Yeah, and get me on LinkedIn, you know, as well. And um, look forward to talking with all of you. And you can tell what it's Wilson because he's got the genuine tick in front of his uh, in his name. So, you know, that's the way, you know, you've got the right Wilson Ma. So thanks, <laughs> Wilson. Have a fantastic right. day. And, and thanks again so much for making Test Festival so awesome. All right. Thanks again. I look forward to the next year. <laughs>